Welcome to the Mark Matusik Media Podcast Series. On this podcast, Mark talks with Sheila Bender. Sheila Bender is an American poet and essayist, best known for her popular books on writing instruction, including Creative Writing Demystified, Writing in a New Convertible with the Top Down, Keeping a Journal You Love, and a memoir, A New Theology, Turning to Poetry in a Time of Grief, which chronicles how reading and writing poetry helped her cope after the loss of her 25-year-old. Her newest collection of poems, entitled Behind Us, The Way Grows Wider, appeared in 2012. Sheila has devoted most of her career to the teaching of writing and the improvement of writing instruction. She founded WritingItReal.com, where she provides an online instructional magazine for those who write from personal experience and offers individual as well as online group writing instruction. A wonderful writer and heartful teacher, she talks to Mark about why criticism doesn't work and how to help writers who are just beginning. Now, here's Mark. Sheila? Hi, Mark. So let's get started. Sheila, just tell me, how did you first get interested in writing? Well, that's a big question. I loved writing my entire childhood. And when I was in third grade or younger, I was asked to write a play for my classroom for the holiday time. And I took this very, very seriously. When I was in seventh grade, I asked permission to write my social studies reports in the form of ballads. (laughs) <laughs> and <laughs> when I was in the angst, I turned to poetry. But when it came time to go to try to judge and try to think about a career, being a writer didn't seem like a career for me. And so I kind of put writing away and became an English teacher. And as an English teacher, I was to keep on to teaching poetry to my students and very attracted to so many books and poets. So after I had my um, children, I realized who I was. that was who I was, and I couldn't raise these kids well being who I wasn't being who I was. So I went to grad, I went to grad point. At that point, I was very lucky to um, be living very close to the University of Washington, where one of the poets I had been teaching, eighth grade, seventh and eighth graders, was a professor, David Wagner. My writing, that's where my writing career really started. Mm, okay. And that so going back a little bit when you from when you say you fell in love with writing as a child was was it uh was it a kind of salvation for you did you feel like the witness in your family what what sort of emotional purpose did writing serve for you as as a as a as a kid I think I was a very shy kid and that's very funny when I look back on it because now I'm a teacher and I'm always talking and in front of people but as a shy kid and I think I was a shy kid because I think I was not heard. I didn't feel heard in my family. And writing was definitely a way of being heard, um, most importantly, by myself. I think that we write in order to hear what we think and feel. And if we keep on working it, the writing, we're able to make contact with other people's minds and hearts and, and have them understand what we think and feel. And then we find that our feelings are universal, really. But there are things that people don't talk about. And I I think that's the other part of it. I think for a lot of us growing up when I did in the 50s and 60s, um, what felt the most real to me wasn't what was honored and dealt with. I I even remember um, feeling very passionate about books I would read and very affected by the stories, novels, and having my father say, well, that's just a story. That's not real. And me thinking, this is more real than anything that anyone around me is doing or thinking or talking about. And when you talk about meeting yourself, witnessing yourself, what happens when we meet ourselves, when we meet our own words, when we meet our own language? What is the transformation that, that takes place, do you think? You ask a really good question. I'm just going to mosey around that one for a while, and we'll see what, what my words do. I, I think that most of us are manipulated by our education into not listening to our words. We have to start our writing with intention. We have to know what we're going to say. We have to conclude by saying what we were supposed to say. And I think that when I studied with poets, what I learned is how our words can be an exploration and wiser than us. And so when we learn to allow our words, to invent our material, to shape it, and and stay away from the judging critic that we all carry around inside us, and in fact, we've absorbed from our schooling. When we learn to allow our words and listen to them and follow them into the message they have for us, we learn what we really know. And a lot of my poet teachers would say, the words are smarter than than I am. 
the words have more wisdom. And I think what happens when we're writing is the two parts of our brains really do sync up and we are in flow. And with that power, we can investigate and articulate what was before unsayable. And I think it does definitely change us. I think the transformation lies in the fact that what we what was swirling around inside of us but not named now has it has a name and it also has a shape like a vessel to live in inside our writing and we're we can move on from there slightly slightly different we might still have the same obsessions we may still be investigating the same perceptions but each time we complete a piece of work we've grown at least that's my experience it's beautifully said. And and how do we how do we silence that inner critic when we're we're trying to access the unknown? Well, until we get into flow, and then at that point it does go away for a while. I don't. Here are my best methods. One is I recognize it, and I I actually do a little self talk. Something like I know you're skilled at editing. I know you can help me make this manifest. I know you can help me reach other people with clarity but I need more material on the page before we can do that. And if you let me do that, you'll have more to work with. <laughs> That's, <laughs> one. <laughs> That's one way. Um, and then the other way, you know, is, is to just keep writing and hear that chatter, but just not stop. Don't cross out. Don't deliberate. One of my favorite writers, the fiction writer Ron Carlson, has a mantra in one of his books about writing. He says, write, don't think. And, and I, I remember that sometimes. It's just keep going. Just follow the words. Mm. Um, they'll lead you somewhere. So it's, kind of, it's a negotiation, really, with, this, with the, the left and the right brain. Yeah, for a while. And then they kind of settle in. Because I think that the right brain is a very shy part of us. Um, mm. And it, you need to invite it. So another thing to do to, to satisfy – I'll do a lot of writing strategies – that satisfy the left brain because the left brain doesn't really like not knowing where it's going. And the right brain is totally, I think, about design and following that design and not having an outline or an, a, a pre-knowledge of where it's going. It's always discovering. And the left brain is always trying to make order. And, and, and I think you need, you need both, but it, the meaning maker in us is very associational and puts together images and details in a way that evokes rather than tells. So there are certain strategies you can use like repetition and other forms that let the left brain settle down, the critic, because no matter where you go, you're ultimately going to come back to the same phrase to repeat it, like in a litany, say. And so the left brain kind of settles down because it doesn't get too scared. Mm. Um, mm. And I think reading a lot of uh, poetry in particular and looking at these strategies can help a writer adopt some of them in their invention stage of writing so that the left brain can kind of feel more comfortable and it stops chattering a little bit. That makes a lot of sense. Let's talk a little bit about the, the healing properties of, of writing. I mean, I know that you used poetry to help you deal with a grief in your life. You know, what, what, how does poetry specifically heal us? I think it's because it's so intimate. I mean, it heals us for the same reasons that so many people are afraid of it. It's very vulnerable. It comes from a very vulnerable part of ourselves. And I don't think we can heal from grief and trauma without facing that vulnerability, allowing it to speak, to be in the world, not disguising it. So I think it heals because it allows us to voice it, whether that's anger, sorrow, joyful memories that are also part of grief. So I think it heals because it's real. And we shy away in most of our interactions from revealing vulnerability, but on the page in poetry, that's what it's all about. And when it's received by you, the writer, as well as any reader, there's the healing happens because it's been shared and received mm. and, and met. I mean, not only received, but met because you reach somebody who also has those feelings. Mm -hmm. And in that, in that joining, a lot of healing happens. Is it also true that poetry sort of speaks at that primal uh, existential level that it's always dealing with big questions even if it's you know a, a trivial sounding poem and that, that sort of the satisfaction of it in, in times of darkness I think so I I think that William Wordsworth in his language said a poem is one man's inside speaking to another so all we have to do is substitute persons a poem is one person's 
inside speaking to another and that's what leads you out of darkness is is mm. the act of speaking um to another who receives it and it is primal in that all of the senses are involved in poetry all five of them and sound is a really important one and sound is is very resonant and just the the act of making your feeling tangible in imagery is is important to healing mm. It sort of engages you with life at a different, at a deeper level. Absolutely, yeah. Tell me, Sheila, when writing instruction doesn't work or when it's not good, what, what are the big traps that writing teachers fall into, do you think? I'm going to go by my own experience because the teacher I am today is really based on changing the way I was taught and being able to teach people how to, being able to facilitate people in finding their work and in listening to it, I think that um, an English, all right, let's see, a writing teacher is different than an English teacher, so we're going to talk about writing teachers, right? I think that we use the word critique group, or I don't, but in the field, the word critique group is used, and in the meaning of the, in the history of the word critique is the phrase to tear apart, and Although our writing is not us, although our writing is something separate, I don't believe that tearing something apart is the way to help a writer. I think it's more like helping a writer grow their writing. And my image for it is um, when seedlings, when seeds sprout, the seedlings have cotyledons, which are a very round-shaped leaf. and They don't look anything like the final signature leaf of a plant, but they're loaded with nutrition and they have to be there to help the sprout grow. And then when they're finished, when they're used up, they just die away. And that's what I think a good teacher does, is allow a writer to keep growing their writing and eventually the parts that are in the way just die off. They're just not needed. The trap that a teacher can get into is critiquing and tearing apart and encouraging others in like a workshop to tear apart rather than respond. I think that it's really important for a writer to hear what happens inside their readers but with I statements, like when I read the poem, I felt happy until I got to this line, and I was very surprised to suddenly feel so sad. I'm not sure I was comfortable with that surprise. That's very different than saying, you didn't earn that last stanza. Right. (laughs) I mean, so personal response is something that really helps. When you can reveal as a reader, as a teacher, what happens inside of you in I statements as a consequence of reading the draft in front of you, you are allowing that writer to allow their own writing to reach its height. And I've trained myself so well that it's really hard for me to think of the traps anymore um, because I teach this to my students too. But I think one trap is having is, is critiquing, tearing apart, because things are often not ready for final editing by a long shot. They still need to grow. And, you know, you just can't, grow something by cutting off its legs. The other thing I think a teacher can do is get ego involved in the poem and want it to sound like one of theirs, say, Mm -hmm. and not honor the the sound of somebody else's work. I think a teacher can not pay attention, which is one of the worst things, is just not to pay attention to the work. I mean, when someone brings you a fledgling piece of writing, it's very important to pay attention and to honor the importance of it, even if it isn't finished or even nearly finished. No matter how much you've written, you're still, when you sit at the blank page, a beginner. And and just like a teacher, Henriette Klausner, who talked a lot years ago about encouraging writing, in a, a uh, program she did, I heard her say, when a, a baby starts toddling and walking, the parents never say, what bad walking, go to your room and don't come out till you know how to walk. <laughs> but <laughs> but when, when we speak and when we write, sometimes we get, Criticism, that's like that, or feels like that. And what we need to remember is that every step forward is important and has to be honored. And there are reviewers who have critiqued me harshly for this. I believe there's a really big difference between published writing that people pay and spend their time reading and work in progress that teachers are encouraging. But when the work is in progress, my own mantra is there is no such thing as bad writing only the opportunity for good writing, and you're constantly looking for the ways in which the words are revealing opportunity. 
Mm. Once it's you know once it's published and out there, that's a whole different thing. But um, when you're the writer writing it from the inside and the teacher teaching those people who are doing it, you have to really honor that that you're listening and looking for opportunity for good writing. Beautiful. So it's very nurturing and and and, and sort of organic in the approach. I think so. A poem and any piece of writing, when it's finished, has to look as if it just popped that way out of the writer's hands and mind and heart, but it it rarely happens that way. It's quite a bit of work to find that part of your writing and to mine it so that it looks so effortless. Mm, Absolutely. And that's one of the healing things. I mean, come to think of it, reaching that place is healing. Uh, John McPhee wrote a piece in The New Yorker a few months back about everything needing four, at least four drafts. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's, what I, that's, that's become my mantra with my students. Is, you know, when, they, when they complain about, isn't it done yet? You know, I just remind them that really you can't expect it to have anything the way, you, the, the way it's meant to be you know, before three or four drafts. It's just, it's just, it's just impossible. And I, you know, I think one of the difficulties for students, for all of us as writers, is rarely have we seen those three or four drafts. It's just becoming visible. There are still, there are just becoming books, anthologies, articles by writers showing this work and what the writer does. Most of us have grown up seeing that seemingly effortless product, and right. um, it's a hard lesson <laughs> to learn how to go through that process yourself. And the other thing that happens, I think, is there is a a part in revision where the writer has gained insight and has learned from it and feels finished, even though that insight isn't yet there enough for others to grasp it when they read it. And I think something a writer has to realize is it really isn't, in my opinion, although writing is cathartic and you can do it just for yourself, for me as a writer, it really is not fully manifest until someone else outside of yourself fully lives your experience and Mm. gains your insight and that does take those drafts to get there so there's still something in it for the writer even though they think they're finished right right absolutely and you're and i love what you're saying it's a dialogue and if it's not a dialogue you're you're, you know you're talking in an echo chamber yeah yeah yeah. and it and it can be very um self-referential and just circle around and not really do that healing work because you haven't haven't seen into it enough. Listen. Yeah. I like the word listen because I think that's what we have to do is listen to our words. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I, I, it's always good for people to read their work out loud. They'll hear the music or, or, or you know, we, we, we can sense what's, what's not working with it when we hear it. Right. You can hear where it goes flat. You can also hear where the music is, but the content hasn't reached out. The music is right. But mm. the content's not there yet. And that's, I think, an important thing, too, is to keep previous drafts because sometimes you lose the music when you're revising. And if you reread your first draft, you'll hear it again, and you'll be able to bring the two together, the content yeah. and the music. Let, let me ask you a little bit, something about uh, truth-telling in memoir. You know, that it's such a slippery slope. Uh, what do you recommend to your students when, when they say, you know, I, I'm afraid of hurting someone's feelings or I'm afraid of embarrassing myself in my story, but I want to tell the truth. I start with you have to tell the truth. You can solve those other problems as you go along. It, you know, when you're draft, when you're revising at the end, when you're editing, but you can't cork up the truth from the beginning and expect to write the book you need to write. So I'm an advocate of telling the truth, but I'm an advocate of telling the truth through the use of details and images, not judgments and, you know, proclamations. Because I think those shut the writing down. And I think when you're telling the truth by using details and images and creating experience on the page rather than telling about it but actually creating it, um, you may find that you're saying things differently than you imagined, that your story is more textured and um, accepting than you might have imagined. And it's hard, though, because it causes you to relive the experience. That's what writing is, the living twice. And we don't always want to do that. So we'll use that editing part of the brain, the left brain, to make proclamations and judgments and just say stuff, tell stuff, when what we need to be doing is evoking the story 
allowing the experience to be there. So what I tell them is you are in worthy company in a workshop or with a teacher, and you have to write the story as you experienced it. Then there are things you can do. You can, if all else fails, publish under a pen name. You can make composite, even in memoir, you can kind of make composite characters if you admit you've done that. You can change names and locations. You can show the manuscript to the people who you fear will be offended and see what they have to say. Um, it's surprising how accepting most people are. You can consult a legal department. There's a lot you can do at the end, but you're never going to write the book unless you start with the truth. Absolutely. And just one more question. Sheila, what are you working on now? I write. I've returned to poetry. My latest book has been a digital book called Sorrows, Words, Writing Exercises to Heal Grief. And the book comes from my experience teaching people after writing my memoir, A New Theology, Turning to Poetry in a Time of Grief. And poetry is kind of my homepage, as you can tell from what I said about my teachers. Um, and after writing a memoir and lots of instructional books, I find that I'm joyously writing poems again. And I did have a, a book of poems come out this year called, or last year, become, no, this year, called Behind Us, The Way Grows Wider. And so I kind of back in the mode of, of writing poems. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it. I, I love your poems, and Thank I recommend you. them to everybody reading this uh, article and listening to this podcast. Thank you. And you can um, also mention my website, writingitreal.com, because one thing I'm always working on are my instructional articles that I put out every week on that website. Okay, great. Great. Oh, I, will be, I will be sure to put that in. Okay. So uh, tell me um, about this. This is an article that you're writing about writing? Well, I'm doing a piece for the Saturday Evening Post uh, about the healing power of writing. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm also doing a series of articles for Psychology Today focused on, on individual teachers. So with your permission, I was going to use this for both of those. You have my permission. I'm very honored. Thank you. And also as a podcast. Thank you so much. And is there anything that I didn't talk about that you would like me to? No, this is this was wonderful. You're a pleasure to interview because you're so clear. Thank it's, you. It's, this is just just great. And if there's anything I need uh, when I'm writing the piece, I'll, I'll write to you and maybe we could fill in some blanks. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I hope you have fun writing it. Thanks, dear. Bye. For more information about Mark's work, join his community at www.markmatusic.com to receive his monthly open book newsletter and learn more about the digital products and autoresponder email courses offered by Mark Matusik Media. To connect with Mark online, visit his site, markmatusik.com, or facebook.com forward slash mark.matusik. And we invite you to follow Mark on Twitter, at 